So this is the difference between conventional wisdom and twisted wisdom. Conventional wisdom is, and most therapists and Rabbanim would tell you, that you tell your son, Chaim, outside in the street, if you don't wear a yarmulke, there's nothing we can do. But in this house, please, wear a yarmulke. Have respect. Even Goyim, when they come to a fancy restaurant, they obey the rules. There's, there's respect of the house. Respect to Kedusha, the other kids. Bobby comes to visit. you got to show respect. Twisted wisdom is as follows. You take Chaim and you pull him in and you look at his eyes and you say, Chaim, outside in the street, if you have to dress up for someone to like you, there's nothing we can do. But in this house, never. Never dress up because we love the real you. Think about what happens to his neshama. Think about the difference in the kid who thinks that these people don't really accept me. They want me to dress up like the kid that they wish I was, right? Even though they know I break Shabbos and they know I don't wear a yarmulke, but they want to just look at a kid who looks like that kid that they wish I was. That's separation. It doesn't make them want to wear a yarmulke. I always say, you don't want your kid to wear a yarmulke. You want them to want to wear a yarmulke. That doesn't happen if we tell him, in our house, you have to put this little shmata on your head. And then we could say, oh, look who's here. In fact... Think about his neshama. Chaim, in this house, never dress up. Never do anything different because you are good the way you are. Now, in the long term, you certainly heal their insides because they feel accepted. But even in the short term, the most amazing thing is they end up wearing the yarmulke much more instead of the other families who are doing conventional wisdom and they're saying, in this house, it's a rule and then every two minutes he forgets it and again you came down without it. Oh, I thought, I felt, I lost it, I don't know where it was, I didn't mean to, what's the big deal? I'm, I'm in my pajamas, I'm upstairs, I'm downstairs. They're arguing all the time because the kid is fighting for his identity and you made it an issue. So I'm going to show them. I'm not going to let them control me. I'm not going to wear a yarmulke. And you're fighting for the yarmulke. It doesn't make them want to wear a yarmulke. There's nothing attractive about Yiddishkeit by saying you have to wear a yarmulke when you're not holding by it or that it hurts you to put it on because people with yarmulkes hurt you. If a kid is in pain because people with yarmulkes, wearing yarmulkes, hurt him or hurt him in the name of yarmulke, in the name of Hashem or Torah, then it's never, you're never going to get the kid back by forcing him and saying, you're not respectful. You see, we take these kids who naturally are so respectful and we think we got to teach them respect. We are not respecting them. That's not the covet in Yedidus that works. But when you go ahead and you reverse it, twist it, and you get into the neshama and you get medicine and you say, Chas v'shalom, never ever dress up. We love the real you. Not only does it help in the future, but it helps for now that what? That they'll put it on much more often. It doesn't bother them. Why not? And these are generally kids who want a shteltsu, who really are not rebellious. When you don't treat them like a rebel, they don't act like a rebel. A couple of weeks later, a couple of months later, they're eating out of your hands. They enjoy being home, and they're home more often. What's the message when we tell them that even though we know you don't wear a yarmulke, but we want to see you with a yarmulke on your head? I'll give you an example. Imagine a family that is a family of clowns. Their parents were clowns. Their grandparents were clowns. For all the generations, they were all professional clowns. And when they raise their kids, everybody's a clown. So they're, you know, they're setting up the table. They're flipping each other the dishes and the forks and the knives, and they're catching it with their mouths, and they're doing summel sauces and walking on wires. The whole family is clowns. And you have a kid who, for some reason, let's say at five years old, he trips and he falls down a flight of stairs, and he breaks his wrist and his knee. After he recovers, he doesn't have, it hurts him. It hurts him to be a clown to juggle and things like that. So he ends up dropping out of clown school. Doesn't work out for him. A couple of years later, he's coming home for the holidays and the parents call him up and they say, Johnny, we know that you're not a clown. We know that. But when you come home, can you do us a favor? Can you put on the clowny nose and the clowny hat? Because when we look around at our kids at our table, at the dinner table, we would feel so much better if at least we can kind of make believe and fool ourselves into thinking that you're really a clown, even though we know it's kind of foolish because you're not a clown. But it would feel so good to see you dressed up like a clown. That's what means a lot to us. That's what us clowns care about. That even if you're not a clown and you're not living a life of a clown, dress up like a clown. Bobby's coming. Grandma's coming. The big clown. She lived her whole life as a clown. For her to see you without the clown, he knows it's going to hurt her so much. If she would know the real you, it would kill her. So do me a favor, put on the nose, 
put on the clowny hat. Like this, we can fool ourselves because we're psychotic people. We can fool ourselves looking at you. We can take a picture and we can make believe inside as though you are the child we wish you would have been. This never works to make a kid want to be part of our religion. It is the biggest turnoff, the biggest rechook to tell them that we are so shallow, superficial, and stupid, and psychotic, that if we know that you're not from, but shtel tzu to the family, put on the things, to just make believe like this, ah, it's a nachas to see you, even though we know you're eating McDonald's when you're not home. That's not a Kirov tool. It doesn't work. Another example is, imagine, God forbid, one of your children is involved in a terror attack in Israel, and they lose an arm, and they're going to come back, and they're going to be Pesach at home. So you call her up, and you say, Shefalu, we love you so much, but you know, it's very nauseating and difficult to eat at the table with your missing arm. So, we have great news. We bought you a fake arm, and if you could just put it on, Okay, if you just stick it in there under your, we'll give you like a jacket, and this way we could all make believe like you have an arm, and we don't have to deal with your life, with your pain. We don't have to let it ruin our lives. We could just go on with our lives, and we'll be okay because you'll look like you have a fake arm. That means a lot to us. That's what we stand for. That's our religion. That's the biggest turnoff in the world. We know that these kids are suffering because of pain. By telling them, that we can't look at your pain. It bothers us to see your life. Actually, we're only seeing the hishtalshalus, the 10 years later, the, the frustration, when it comes out of them, we're seeing a drop of it manifests itself with the lack of tzniyas and the different types of stuff, the piercings, sometimes tattoos. That's just a little tiny drop in the bucket of their actual pain. And we're saying, we can't look at you. We can't look at you. No, I can't look at your pain. We can't look at you manifesting the pain that's inside of you for years. They'll find people who say, wow, I'm willing to look at you. I see your good and I'm willing to live with your pain and feel your pain. That's sympathy. That's empathy. That makes them want to be around us. We are in a tug of war with the street. We have to give these kids more love, acceptance, and make them feel comfortable being dysfunctional and carry them through the years of pain and darkness that they go through. The parents who do that have the highest chance, everyone agrees, the highest chance, if you don't drop the patient, you have the highest chance of one day walking him down the chuppah. No question about it. And that's the difference between conventional wisdom and twisted wisdom.